good evening everybody a warm welcome on behalf of the ibd emerging nations consortium with great pleasure i uh, i extend a warm welcome for you to join the first ever ibd master class just to set a background a little bit about us at ibd emerging nations consortium our developing world we are seeing ibd emerging we earlier had infectious diseases we were kept busy with it but now every day the numbers keep piling up and it's not restricted to india it's not re restricted to south asia it's across this entire region of south asia southeast asia middle east and now on to africa as well estimated burden of disease in india itself because of the large population we may soon surpass the disease burden of even north america but look at our problems ibd is not considered as a public health problem there are no true population based registries there's limited access to healthcare facilities there's poor physician awareness of the disease and of course we are still struggling confusion over its overlap with infective diarrhea there are unique challenges with ibd management here some are obviously diagnostic we all keep on discussing the tb versus crohn's dilemma there is this inadequate patient awareness and physician awareness there's poor accessibility to a higher tertiary center availability of basic diagnostic services and the entire covid scenario has actually highlighted how much we lack in awareness therapeutic our main burden what to do when the best is unaffordable can we really treat to target is asian ibd different there are so many questions and we all thought that there is no data from these emerging nations there are very few dedicated ibd specialists dedicated ibd units are rare there is time manpower and of course funding constraints there is a need of data to formulate guidelines suited to the region what we need to do for our population so we first got together as a key opinion leaders platform across this region we found our challenges were the same then we got together 22 countries and here was the first picture that we took together and you can see we are all working for how to deal best with ibd we have a international advisory board now with top stalwarts across the globe professor ruben is here with us dr nageshwar reddy professor michael camp professor simon travis professor suing suing Charles Bernstein, Iris Dotan, uh, I Ailsa Hart, Professor Silvio Genis, Dr. Yuchin Jin, all stalwarts, all who have become our big friends. We've taken small steps ahead. We are now a registered society. We have published together as a group. Our collaborative projects are on. We have uh, the international advisory board, board with top global stalwarts. overall we are all friends working together this is our first study which we did lot of uh, uh, you know limitations but still a first effort of more than 10000 patients across the region we found that our ibd is different regarding the covid 19 pandemic how it was managed we did a survey across this region again and we have got these collaborative projects on we've now developed the new interactive web platform we are 20 plus countries 1000 plus members a web platform for all practicing gastroenterologists and physicians what do we have here and this is for everyone we have a personalized ibd registry for members a difficult case discussion forum an ibd journal scan with top 10 articles across the globe and also articles maybe in lesser known journals from the region latest ibd news section and of course patient education interface or forum overall 
IBDENC is a collaborative effort. We wish to share and learn from each other to develop the best practice strategy for IBD management in this part of the world. And today, we start the IBD Masterclass, a monthly educational seminar and CME by top IBD experts, live talks by leading international experts, and of course, a cultural exchange as well. For the IBD Masterclass, we again have a star cast of directors with Dr. JN Ramesh, Dr. Jayanti, Dr. Usha Datta, Dr. Farooq Ahmed from Bangladesh, Dr. Malati Satyasekaran, a top pediatric IBD specialist, Professor Christopher from Malaysia, Professor Nuni from Myanmar, Professor Pise from Thailand, and Professor Joe Solano from Indonesia. So we have this star cast. And to say a few words on the IBD Masterclass, I would request our course directors for today, Dr. Jayanti and Dr. G. N. Ramesh. Over to you, Dr. Jayanti. Thank you, Dr. Rupa. Good evening to all. Um, we've already heard a good introduction to the IBD ENC Consortium. The IBD Masterclass has been the brainchild of Dr. Rupa Banerjee, and she's introduced this for the first time to the country. Her introduction of this IBD Emerging Nation Consortium has steered several nations to join this group and includes centers from Middle East, Southeast Asia, and extends as far as Nairobi and other African countries. With the introduction of this consortium, as she has already alluded to, there have been several deliberations in these past few months amongst the core members, which has culminated in the introduction of multi-center research projects, some of which are already on the way. The master class, which is being introduced today, will be a series of sessions which will benefit gastroenterologists, practicing physicians, and GI fellows on all aspects of IBD, one at a time. We aim to discuss clinical problems that one confronts in day-to-day -day practice on a case-to-case -case basis. The session will primarily be a case-based discussion with a multidisciplinary approach, which you'll be listening today, on challenges faced by physicians in resource-constrained regions, and thereby this particular platform will bring in all the participating patients in under one roof. The IBD Masterclass, as a group has already mentioned, will be held once a month on every Friday around the same time. The highlight of today's program will be a guest lecture by Professor Rubin, and this will be followed by a discussion on diagnosis and management, issues that are related to small bowel strictures, which though a common problem is seldom debated. On behalf of my co-host director, Dr. G. N. Ramesh, and my own self, I welcome you all to this academic feast. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jayanti, for uh, the kind words. I would request I would request Dr. Nageshwar Reddy, the chairman and mentor for the entire IBD ENC program, to please say a few words on this occasion. Everybody and welcome to this IBD ENC Masterclass. The IBD Emerging Nation Consortium was started a couple of years back. Uh, uh, it was a brainchild of Dr. Rupa Banerjee. Uh, since then, it's become extremely popular. Over 25 nations have joined this with a membership of over 1,000 uh, gastroenterologists in all these countries. The website which has been created for this has attracted a lot of attention both from the doctors and from the pharmaceutical industry and has become a very dynamic site for interactions and so on. As a part of the initiative of this IBD ENC, uh, these master classes have been started which will be held every month where we invite a world leader in IBD to give his thoughts on a particular subject with interaction from several other leaders in these emerging countries. I think this is an extremely useful initiative and the fact that the first master class is going to be done by David Rubin who will be introduced formally later on. These master classes are an initiative of the IBD ENC 
where masters in IBD are going to interact with uh, doctors in this ENC platform, with leaders in the ENC also going to interact in this uh, forum. The first master class is going to be by David Rubin, who is a professor of uh, uh, IBD at Chicago. It is an honor and pleasure to have you with us for this uh, inaugural master class. So I am sure that all of you are going to attend this master class, are going to have an extremely productive academic experience with this. And hopefully, as we continue to have evolved in this master class area, we are going to get uh, new initiatives coming in. Along with this master class, we are also going to have a model country each time and this time is going to be Nepal where we like to know the incidence of this uh, disease pattern and of course the local cultures uh, influence what happens especially with the gut microbiome and also uh, IBD incidences and so on. I am sure this experience uh, over these next few hours are going to be extremely productive and uh, of course uh, be very important for all of us at this ENC. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Reddy. Uh, I would now request our chief guest, uh, Professor David Rubin, to kindly say a few words on this inaugural session of IBD Masterclass at IBD ENC. Well, thank you, Rupa. And I want to welcome everybody to the inaugural IBD Masterclass. While we've all faced the challenges of the last year and the global pandemic, the one bright spot has been bringing people together through technology in ways like this. And as much as I wish I was there in person, I certainly recognize the incredible value of having people from so many different places able to log on together and learn from one another. And I'm looking forward to the opportunity to share some of my thoughts about diagnosis in IBD today and to learn from all of you. It is a great honor for me to be your first speaker in this incredible course that all of you have contributed and as multiple people have acknowledged was the brainchild of who I think of as an IBD ambassador, Rupa Banerjee. I want to officially declare that the IBD masterclass is now open. Thank you, everybody. Over to Ida now for the talk of the evening. Thank you, Rupa. And uh, again, uh, it gives me really great pleasure to be part of this. I'm going to have to put on my reading glasses now just to show you my age. Um, okay, so um, I'd like to, um, it gives me really great pleasure to introduce uh, the main speaker uh, who the, who's going to inaugurate the IBD Master Class, and that's Dr. David Rubin. He's the chief of the section of gastroenterology, hepatology and nutrition, and the co-director of the Digestive Diseases Center at the University of Chicago Medicine. Prior to this, he served for 11 years as the director of gastroenterology, hepatology and nutrition uh, fellowship program. He currently serves as an associate faculty member at the McLean Center for Clinical Medical Ethics and associate investigator at the University of Chicago Comprehensive Cancer Center. In view of his outstanding contribution um, Dr. Rubin has received many awards, Best Doctors, America's Top Physicians, American College of Gastroenterology's Governor's Awards of Excellence in Clinical Research, the Cancer Research Foundation Young Investigators Award, Ulcerative Colitis Postgraduate Teaching Award, to name a few. And in 2012, he received the uh, Crohn's and Colitis Foundation Rosenthal Award, which is a national leadership award bestowed upon a volunteer who has contributed in an indisputable way to the quality of life of patients and families. 
He is currently the chair-elect of the National Scientific Advisory Committee for the CCF. He is an associate editor of the journal Gastroenterology and co-editor of the ACG Online Educational Universe. Um, Dr. Rubin is the editor of a best-selling book on inflammatory bowel disease, and he has published extensively in peer-reviewed journals. His current research is in the area of progressive complications from uncontrolled inflammation, the doctor-patient relationship in IBD, and a variety of collaborative studies related to the microbiome and intestinal diseases. And that's just an abbreviated version of his CV. Uh, it gives me great pleasure, uh, again, um, for, uh, to introduce Dr. Rubin, who will be presenting his talk on unmet needs and goals of IBD diagnosis in 2021. Dr. Rubin. Thank you so much. And actually, as of April 1st, I just became the chair of the Scientific Advisory Committee for the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation uh, in the United States. And one of my major initiatives is going to be expanded partnerships with our friends around the world. So you're the first to hear it from me, and I'm excited and hope to work with all of you. Congratulations. Uh, oh, thank you. So this uh, talk is uh, important. It's a good place to start when we think about what our goals are and what the unmet needs are. Uh, and I'm delighted to have the opportunity to provide some of my insights into this and some pearls. And I recognize that there's a broad audience of very experienced people who are participating in this masterclass. So forgive me if some of this seems uh, more basic, um, but I also have included more advanced topics for those who are interested. So I'll do my best to cover this broad topic uh, in a comprehensive way over the next 30 minutes. I live in the community where the University of Chicago is, and this is the view I have as I walk to work and the sun is rising over the beautiful Lake Michigan. Our campus is uh, unique in that we have the hospital and the university together. If you look carefully in the distance, you can see the skyline of Chicago, which is four miles from here. Uh, and our hospital, which is the large building in the, four, in the background here, is uh, unique as well because we have an inpatient inflammatory bowel disease service, among other things that we do here. And I just share this with you because it would be my great pleasure in the future to welcome any of you who would like to come visit us uh, and to learn from us and for us to learn from you. So I'm extending an invitation. I do have some disclosures, although arguably none of them are directly relevant to what I'm going to present to you. This talk is 100% mine, and I take responsibility for everything I have to say. So the typical features of ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease are well known to this audience. And the two diseases, ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease, have been separated for many, many years and have been thought of as sister diseases. They both are characterized by chronic, uncontrolled inflammation, and the location of the disease varies between the two diseases, with, of course, ulcerative colitis confined to the large intestine, and Crohn's disease, by definition, potentially involving any portion of the GI tract. We also recognize some differences in the pathogenesis, as well as the clinical and pathological features of these diseases, as well as the changes that may occur over time due to progression of the diseases and potential complications and coexisting extraintestinal manifestations. You know all of that. The diagnosis of inflammatory bowel disease is based on the gold standard of clinical, radiographic, endoscopic, and importantly, histologic findings. They have to be combined together in the right clinical scenario for us to suspect and to confirm inflammatory bowel disease. I would add one additional feature that is not often emphasized enough, which is the element of time. Sometimes it's not entirely clear what somebody has, and over time it becomes more obvious. There's an old expression, time is on the doctor's side, meaning that if you follow someone long enough, something that may be obscure or difficult to figure out often becomes more obvious. In thinking about this talk, I outlined and identified a number of challenges to the diagnosis of IBD. 
The first is that it's often confused with other conditions that are more common, functional bowel disorders among them, as well as infections, as you well know, or even food intolerance. And therefore, the diagnosis is often delayed or late. And we are often left with a disease that has already progressed or had complications by the time we make the diagnosis. And then we're always trying to catch up, which is a very challenging point about making the diagnosis of IBD. In addition, there are the diagnostic classification systems that we've used for over 100 years remain imprecise, and there are changes that occur over time that challenge these diagnostic classifications. Unfortunately, one of the biggest limitations, and I think one of the most important priorities for all of us, is that our classification systems don't directly influence medical management and they need to in the near future. And I'll share some of that with you as we go through this presentation. And lastly, heterogeneity of disease types has confounded our management clinically, as well as very importantly, our clinical trials. In other words, when we lump everybody together with ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease and put them in a clinical trial, it's not surprising to see limitations in response and remission rates because we're actually treating multiple different types of diseases. I'm a big fan of the history of IBD, and I want to emphasize to you a couple of points. Um, the concept of what we now call Crohn disease or Crohn's disease, which technically it should be Crohn disease, and you may know that already, actually was, um, has been debated because there was a nice report by a man from Scotland, uh, Dial, who first published on chronic interstitial enteritis 20 years before the reports in New York City in the United States. And so while this uh, is now known as Crohn disease, it may be more accurate to start talking more about regional enteritis again as we start breaking these diseases into other characteristics. There's a long story about how Crohn, Ginsburg, and Oppenheimer did not get along, and Ginsburg maintained until the day he died that there were some discrepancies about who did what in their paper, but that's a topic for another talk. But let's give Dial his due credit uh, for contributing to the field in important ways. Now, subsequent to the description that was in the uh, AMA and published in JAMA, uh, there were other descriptions of chronic inflammation, including Harris's report of involvement of the jejunum, other reports of the colon involvement, the small bowel, and the stomach. And therefore, there have been multiple descriptions of this disease and it evolved over time from the initial descriptions of the fibrostenotic ileum involvement to recognition that it could involve all parts of the disease. And the first published description of what they called Crohn's of the colon is there for you to see in 1959. It was actually of interest that Crohn himself disagreed that what they were seeing in the colon was the same disease that he and his colleagues were involved with in the ileum. So there's been an evolution of what we've done in IBD. And although I'm focusing on the top here, which is our classifications, we've of course had evolution in treatments and evolution in what I call macro management, which includes this master class, which is how people have worked together. From the classifications, we've gone from phenotypes to more genetics, to immunological typing, to now some focus on the appropriately environment, including the microbiome. And I'm not gonna talk about treatments, that's topics for other days I know, but we've gone from desperation to evidence-based medicine, to disease-modifying therapies, to treat to target and altering the natural history of the disease. And lastly, we've gone from different organizations funding research to collaborative efforts to understand worldwide phenomenon. So over time, what we've seen and the emphasis that I will have in the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation over the next several years while I'm working with them is about reclassifying these diseases in meaningful ways, focusing on effective, sustainable, and safe therapies that I would add should be affordable and widely accessible and are organized uh, professional and patient societies and activities to improve access and education. So let's focus now on the diagnosis. 
the first goal of managing IBD is to obtain a clear and accurate diagnosis. A clear diagnosis of IBD should provide information that first explains the patient's current symptoms and problems. In other words, what you find should adequately add up to explain the way the patient presented and their laboratory abnormalities. It needs to be accurate and withstand the test of time, meaning that if you give someone a diagnosis of IBD, you would like it to be accurate enough that over time it will remain and be clear. Very importantly, you want the diagnosis of IBD to include some element of prognosis so that you can think down the road. We don't like to think of IBD anymore as an acute crisis-based management, but rather a chronic disease that requires planning and proactive intervention. The diagnosis should make a distinction between management decisions that we choose now and those that will affect and change the natural history. And the diagnosis may have implications for others. Although the majority of people with IBD have no family history, we are learning about those in the family that may have an increased risk, and we are developing preventive strategies for higher risk individuals. Very importantly, when you make a diagnosis of IBD, it should include the disease extent and the current disease activity and some element of prognosis. Separating activity and severity is a key goal in identifying the type of IBD and making a clear diagnosis. Activity is how sick the patient is now. Severity has to do with what's likely to happen in the future or what has already happened in the past. And using severity can guide us to monitor more aggressively or change management preemptively so that we don't end up with more complications. The diagnosis of IBD includes making sure that we're ruling out what are called impostors or confusing coexisting problems, thinking about extra intestinal symptoms and signs, not just because we want those to be treated as well, but because I actually believe that when patients have coexisting extra intestinal immune problems, it gives us a clue to the pathogenesis and reevaluation over time so that you understand what might be evolving before your eyes and as well know whether the disease is being managed properly. This requires ileal colonoscopy with biopsy, the distinction between overlapping functional bowel disorders and those that are due to inflammation, a reliable a colleague and expert pathology, uh, evaluation of the small bowel in some way, which may be initially ileoscopy during your colonoscopy, but may require cross-sectional imaging or even capsule endoscopy in some situations. I'm a big fan of working with our colorectal surgeons for an exam under anesthesia to clarify the perianal disease, and I'll talk more about that, and using other clues to clarify diagnosis, including family history, sometimes serologies, and working with our colleagues who are not gastroenterologists like rheumatologists or dermatologists to help us. When we consider the differential diagnosis of IBD, uh, it depends on a variety of factors. In Asia, one of the most important things that you know much more than I is tuberculosis, but other infectious colitides, including of course, clostridioides, difficile, and now even presenting with a SARS-CoV-2 infection may present with some symptoms or findings that may look like IBD. Of course, there are a variety of other things that we could get into, but you understand the importance of thinking carefully. If you have an older patient, for example, think about ischemia, whether that might be confused for IBD. And if you have a younger patient, is there something else that may even be congenital or otherwise contributing to the presentation? Diagnosis must include histopathology. And I work with some wonderful pathologists who have taught me the value of understanding chronicity, as well as looking for clues that what might look like IBD may in fact be a monogenic form of inflammation, which I'll talk about in a few more minutes. But you can see clearly here this biopsy from one of my patients with ulcerative colitis and the corresponding crypt architectural distortion with the uh, infiltrate of inflammatory cells. In addition, while we value granulomas, and we now know that granulomas in the presence of Crohn's disease are associated with a worse prognosis, 
We of course also recognize granulomas may be related to many other things. So you uh, always need to be thinking about those and whether that might be more appropriate for your patient and thinking carefully about whether this patient might in fact have TB or a fungal infection or actually other immune conditions. There have been some wonderful articles that have tried to distinguish Crohn's disease from intestinal tuberculosis. It's more common in Crohn's to have diarrhea than intestinal TB, for example, and it's more common to have fever in intestinal TB than it is in Crohn's, although both conditions can look like the other. So it's key to rule out tuberculosis in these patients when they present to you. Although it's uncommon for intestinal TB to present with perianal disease, it can do so, as you probably know and have seen. So you still need to think about TB even when there's that perianal manifestation. There have been attempts to describe the endoscopic appearance of either intestinal TB or even Bichette's disease. And although I've tried to learn from my colleagues who say they can tell, I will tell you that we've all been fooled. And obviously biopsies and cultures and uh, serologic testing with quantiferon are necessary in order to distinguish TB from chronic inflammation related to Crohn's disease. Now, there are a number of clues in the history, and I teach this to my fellows every day. We want to know more about what were actually the early symptoms and when did they start prior to diagnosis. And as you know, many patients will have symptoms for years before they get diagnosed. What does the patient mean when they say they're having diarrhea, pain, or bleeding? Because that can be different depending on the patient and the context. And what they say is different than what we say as, as medical professionals. We should always look for things that wake them up from sleep or unexplained weight loss as clues. In children and adolescents, one of the most important clues is not that the child describes abnormal bowels, but of course that they're not growing or developing appropriately. And that is a very important marker of when the disease onset may have occurred when you look at their growth chart. Although the family history can be a very important clue, remember most people don't have a family history. And even among families where there's one person with Crohn's, about 25% of the time, if it's truly a family history, there may be discordance with the type of IBD presenting to you. Not to mention that I've learned that patients often don't know what their family members have. And lastly, is this really self-limited? So it may look just like IBD, but follow-up is essential. Now on the exam, of course, you know that we're looking for obvious intestinal and abdominal findings, but don't forget the extra intestinal manifestations. I look very carefully at the eyes and the skin, and I do examine the joints as well as the back. Uh, I have the patient bend forward and I feel the sacroiliac joints. And you also wanna to remember to look carefully on their bottom, which you all know, but unfortunately, as you know, our colleagues in primary care and our trainees often don't look, or they look, but they don't know what they're seeing. And this is obviously a patient with a small abscess and a skin tag. Now, there's been an evolving understanding of the phenotypes of IBD, and defining these phenotypes is very important, not only because it clarifies diagnosis, but it does help us with prognosis and understanding natural history. It helps us identify effective therapies or knowing how to deliver those therapies. It helps us avoid some therapies that may be ineffective, like amino salicylates when there's penetrating or stenotic Crohn's disease. And obviously, phenotypes can help guide research. And I've been arguing that we aren't doing a good job at that. Many of the pharma-sponsored clinical trials focus only on what the regulatory agencies require and not on more clear division of patients into subtypes, which could be really useful for all of us. Ultimately, finding the right phenotypes may lead to some cures, which I'll talk about. Now, the classification of IBD from the 1950s to the present has been divided, as you see in this Venn diagram, where with Crohn's disease, we focus on a majority who have ileal colitis, but recognize that involvement of the colon only is described in about a quarter of patients, and in ulcerative colitis, in adults, 70% are diagnosed with less than pan colitis, but it may extend in 30 to 50% over time. And there's a group right in the middle that we used to call indeterminate. We now call them IBD unclassified, where there's overlapping features and where we're having difficulty figuring out what they have. 
This plays the most important role when a patient isn't responding to therapy and we're talking about surgical approaches to their management. So we have a clear need to improve our classification systems to help us with diagnosis, to develop a directed approach to identifying causes and cures, and recognizing the heterogeneity of these diseases in ways that are clinically meaningful. So what we have now is the Montreal classification for ulcerative colitis, which divides patients by uh, extent of disease, as you can see here, and doesn't focus on severity or necessarily prognosis. And the Crohn's disease phenotype classifications, which are the Vienna classification and the Montreal classification, which focus on age of diagnosis, location of the disease, and perianal. You'll notice that the Montreal classification added a modifier for perianal disease, specifically in that behavioral type. And that's important because 20% of patients with Crohn's may have perianal disease coexisting with their luminal disease. Now, ulcerative colitis variants that aren't explained by the Montreal classification are important to recognize. If we only focus on the Montreal classification, we're gonna be confused and call some patients Crohn's disease when they may have just a variant of UC. This may be the disease in evolution where it's early onset and it hasn't expressed itself fully. It may be the patient with distal disease and a periappendiceal red patch. It may be somebody who has proximal or gastric involvement in kids with ulcerative colitis. Rectal sparing is well described, um, especially in patients with primary sclerosing cholangitis, a discordant family history, or even discordant serologic markers. The arrow is pointing to the appendiceal orifice. And in a study we did years ago, we showed that the amount of inflammation around the appendix was histologically similar to the amount of inflammation in the distal colon. And we believe this is a variant of ulcerative colitis and shouldn't be called Crohn's. There have been a variety of endoscopic severity indices developed to help us clarify what we're dealing with. And it's important that you understand what these are and adopt them in your practice not just because you want to be able to communicate with each other about what you're seeing, but you want to communicate back to yourself when you repeat an exam in an individual patient. For Crohn's disease, we have the simplified endoscopic score, and for ulcerative colitis, we have both the Mayo score and the ulcerative colitis endoscopic index of severity. And I'm sure you know that. These should be included on endoscopy reports when possible. Recognizing that, it's actually difficult and it takes time. Look at all the variations in my patients with Crohn's disease. You know how it can look and how uh, variable the, the endoscopic appearance can be. And when you try to calculate the Crohn's disease endoscopic index of severity, if you're going to do this and you're very busy, which you all are, it takes some time to do it, even if you have an endoscopic reporting system on a computer that enables you to do some of this easier. And on top of that, as some of you know, we're not necessarily treating to complete healing in Crohn's disease like we are thinking about in ulcerative colitis. So as much as I'm here to tell you that you should learn about this, I'm not as convinced that we should all be doing this every time we scope somebody. And of course, the CDEIS doesn't include perianal disease, which has to be carefully documented and should be further clarified with help from our surgeons and additional imaging studies. Ulcerative colitis, while we think of it as being more homogenous, can also be quite heterogeneous. And you see the variations here in how ulcerative colitis can look. And I know you appreciate this, but when we start talking about using histology as a marker of disease activity or as a target for treatment, which it's not yet, you can also appreciate why biopsies can look pretty patchy under the microscope in some cases of ulcerative colitis. The Mayo score and the ulcerative colitis and endoscopic index of severity have some similarities and are summarized on this uh, figure, which is from the UC guidelines for the American College of Gastro that we published a couple years ago. And you can appreciate the side-by-side -side scoring systems. It's actually the UCEIS that's more discriminant for risk of colectomy. And I do need to give credit to a lot of work that's going on in multiple places now on artificial intelligence and how that might help us. This is from our colleague, uh, Mamoru Watana Watanabe, 
in Japan and his colleagues, and they've published some very nice work looking at artificial intelligence. And there's some additional work going on in other places around the world, which might simplify and standardize our approach to this, not just from a severity uh, approach, but from a clinical trials approach, and of course, from a diagnostic approach. So stay tuned on that. Charles Bernstein years ago published this very nice study that he says is one of his favorites. And this is about the fact that at the time of diagnosis, the first colonoscopy in ulcerative colitis can appear patchy. And it emphasizes the very important point that you need to biopsy from the areas that look normal, as well as those that look inflamed at the time you're making a diagnosis. And actually the histologic uh, involvement of the disease may be more informative in those settings than what you see endoscopically. Interestingly, with some of our new JAK inhibitors, we're seeing histological improvement before we see endoscopic improvement. And there's been some interesting work that suggests that there's a discrepancy in how these appear. So don't forget to biopsy what looks normal when you do those colonoscopies. We also have a score for the late Paul Rootgeertz, uh, who passed away last year, unfortunately, uh, that helps us grade post-operative recurrence and is being validated in a variety of efforts right now based on how much disease is seen when you scope a patient after they've had surgery with a primary anastomosis in Crohn's. And we've developed an approach to standardized pouchoscopy evaluations. This is the uh, figure and the standard approach we use at the University of Chicago. And in press right now in CGH is the proposed Chicago classification of pouchitis, recognizing all the different phenotypes of pouch inflammation in those who've had a proctocolectomy. So try to be precise and consistent when you're making a diagnosis and in follow-up in your endoscopic reports. Remember, you're describing what you're seeing endoscopically, and therefore you should be using terms like endoscopically quiescent or endoscopically moderately active and leave the histological assessment to our pathology colleagues, as well as recognizing the clinical assessment, which may be very different. So I want you to be precise when you use your endoscopy reports, not just at the time of diagnosis, but in future as well. On the left is what I do in all of my IBD patients at the time of diagnosis or the first time I'm scoping them, which is I use a biopsy forceps to uh, identify the ileocecal valve so I can get a picture of it on FOSS. And I believe that this is a very helpful way to clarify what the valve looks like which can be a clue to Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis, and may also give you a clue to a patient who has backwash ileitis, where the valve may appear patchulous. And I've already shown you the periappendiceal red patch as something to look carefully for when you're doing these exams. Remember too that severe ulcerative colitis can be confused for Crohn's. This patient doesn't have patchy ulcerations. This patient has complete absence of mucosa. You're actually looking at submucosa there. This was a pregnant woman whose Crohn's actually got, uh, uh, sorry, whose ulcerative colitis got out of control. Uh, she was off therapy at the time of her pregnancy and conception. And of course, cross-sectional imaging is critical. Not only a baseline assessment of small bowel involvement, but that the evaluation may change over time looking for functional uh, evidence of obstruction with proximal dilation. The cine loops that we can get from MRIs now are quite helpful, and also, of course, to exclude complications. Intriguing to me was a pre presentation at DDW a couple years ago from China, where they noted that on review of MRIs, up to 20% of patients without physical findings or symptoms of perianal disease had signal intensity in the perianal area. In other words, often we're missing patients who are at risk for perianal Crohn's disease, and it definitely has implications for how we might diagnose or manage them. Now, I hinted at this earlier, and I want to point out to you that we've had some evolution in our understanding of the very early onset or monogenic types of IBD. So remember that it's not always just Crohn's disease because you see inflammation of the small bowel. And there's a listing here of multiple different contributors that can look like Crohn's, but would obviously have very different treatment strategies, including very importantly, patients who have combined variable immune def deficiency where they are treated with IVIG and a variety of other specific problems. There's in fact a large multi-center 
consortium looking at very early onset IBD. And if you have a patient in whom you suspect this, you should be looking to their website, which is extremely helpful, veoibd.org. And now we're starting to realize that some of the young adults we're seeing have had this, but were not diagnosed when they were younger. So we now are starting to test adults for some of these um, genome-wide uh, uh, studies to know if they in fact have these problems. So there'll be more about that. Now, part of diagnosis, as I mentioned, is prognosis, recognizing that ulcerative colitis has variable behaviors and recognizing that Crohn's disease can have variable behaviors. We have recognized that over time, we'd like to impose treatments that modify progression or changes that lead to complications and knowing who's at risk is very important. So for example, we've learned that ulcerative colitis can progress from being distal involvement, up to 50% of patients will involve the entire colon. And then of course, we know those patients have a higher risk for surgery, hospitalization, relapse, and neoplasia. And now some more research we're doing shows they have higher risk for rectal um, involvement that leads to non-compliance of the rectum. Patients who are at higher risk for colectomy and ulcerative colitis are well described and you should know what they are. They include not just the extent of disease, but patients who have low albumins, those who've had infections or required hospitalizations, or who've needed uh, steroids, as well as those who have deep ulcers when you scope them. Assessment of prognosis is part of the diagnosis when you make it for IBD. And now thinking about IBD as a systemic inflammatory disorder, as I mentioned, this can be a clue to many things. We've now learned that in fact, there are shared genetic uh, contributors to not just the intestinal disease, but to multiple extra intestinal manifestations. And we've learned to think carefully about these overlaps. Now, you've been well aware for many years about the serologies that have been described to distinguish Crohn's from ulcerative colitis. And these have been described uh, repeatedly, and there've been other uh, attempts to identify other uh, glycosylation markers related to the difference between Crohn's and UC. But notice what I said at the top in the title here. These are not recommended to make a diagnosis. They are too non-specific. On the other hand, there's some interesting work that's been done that suggests that we can look at P-ANCA, for example, as a predictor of response to infliximab. And you can see here that patients who have a high p anca titer um, were more likely to uh, be, excuse me, less likely to be responsive to infliximab. What about genetics? Can we use that to diagnose IBD or change therapy? Well, not quite yet, despite 20 years of hard work in this area. What we've learned from our colleagues is that there are now almost 300 genetic single nucleotide polymorphisms associated with IBD, and they actually help us decide on extent and location, which is very interesting to us, but it doesn't necessarily help us in management. And remember that something like NOD2, which has the strongest genetic association with Crohn's, is not present in Asians with Crohn's disease. So that's not gonna be as helpful. We can look at what we learned about the differences between Europeans and East Asians to know that some of the genetic markers are not the same among groups. So keep this in mind as we start learning more about genetics. And as been mentioned already during the introductory comments, thinking about the microbiome is absolutely important because of course we'd like to understand whether that's the main contributor to the rise of IBD we're seeing around the world, and in particular in the Asian countries. Can this be the explanation, or is the microbiome that we're measuring currently just the result of something else? Well, I think there's some great future work that can be done here, um, but we aren't quite there yet. Right now, it's prim primarily descriptive people describing that patients with IBD have much more variability of their microbiome, or they have specific um, preferential expression of certain organisms and colonies that can be detected. 
We haven't seen remarkable discoveries yet, although there are a variety of people who are working on bacterial derived proteins as potential treatments. And we've learned now that although diet is the fastest way to change the microbiota, it may not control the inflammation or do so in a durable way. So there's a lot more for us to learn about, but I'm optimistic about the future. So when thinking about our future considerations for diagnosis of IBD, I think that earlier diagnosis has implications for treatment and will help us get to where we need to be in more patients. How do we make an earlier diagnosis? Well, I'm preaching to the choir, to all of you, you know to think about IBD when a patient is sent to you. But we have to educate our colleagues who are not gastroenterologists or gastrointestinal surgeons so that they are thinking about the diagnosis. We need a clinically meaningful reclassification of IBD that's based on immunological and genetic features. We need to develop immune panels and companion diagnostic biomarkers that will directly influence therapy selection that is underway. I call that the holy grail in IBD management. And we certainly need further clarification of the monogenic forms of IBD because some of these have potential for cure and certainly different treatments as I've taught you today. And lastly, as I mentioned earlier, we need an identification of at-risk individuals and prevention strategies. I'll summarize with two slides. The first one is this interesting work by Marla Dubinsky and Corey Siegel, as well as Lori Siegel, who um, contributed. That's Corey Siegel's wife, who's uh, an incredible scientist as well. And they described the combination of genetic, clinical, and immune markers to predict the need for surgery in Crohn's. This was recently acquired and converted into an actual diagnostic test that gives a patient and their provider, their doctor, a curve that tells them what's the risk for this patient with Crohn's disease having surgery in the next five years. The important thing about understanding this is to understand how it might influence your choice of treatment, as well as the patient's willingness to use certain therapies. So my final slide is this one. There are many challenges to diagnosis of IBD. The basics are well described and I've covered them for you today. But remember that it includes separation of activity and severity, understanding the location of the disease as well as the extraintestinal manifestations, having a sense for the prognosis of that patient, and then thinking about a way to characterize each individual patient based on a variety of different uh, markers that might guide us in the future in choices of therapy, prevention of complications, changing the natural history, and ultimately, we would love to have cures for these conditions. This is our IBD center pre-pandemic, no masks. And uh, on behalf of all of them, I want to say thank you to all of you. Thank you very much, um, yeah, Professor Rubin, for that uh, fantastic uh, presentation. Um, question as a moderator. Do you, until we come up with this, um, I, I think Steph Targan once mentioned this some talk a long time ago, that will there be a time when we will have IBD as a IBD one, two, three, four, five, six, as opposed to this very old fashioned Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis? Because right now, would you not agree it's pretty inaccurate and somewhat clumsy because one of the problems I have is for example is when I take part in clinical trials as well you know where you have to be one or the other and the uh, IBD unclassified and not allowed to come in and I feel these are just such major pitfalls with, with what's happening at the moment. Uh, thank you for the question and for the comment. Uh, I completely agree with you. In fact uh, one of the uh, conversations I've had with the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation they asked me what I thought our big initiative, our moonshot should be over the next three years while I'm chair of their advisory committee. And my belief was that we should focus completely on a meaningful reclassification of IBD that addresses all the things you just said, improves our approach to clinical trials, explains to patients that not all IBD is the same. Imagine when a patient has mild Crohn's, but they go online to read about Crohn's disease, they come across everything and it's, it's overwhelming, um, but also because it'll help us develop targeted and appropriate therapies. 
we're 20 years behind oncology. And I don't think we need to be. I think our cancer colleagues have done a great job and obviously a lot of research drove that, um, but we have those things. It's a matter of saying, for example, just simply, I showed you the Pianca titer predicting response to infliximab. Why don't we go back to that now with the, the technologies we have and do this in a more uh, predictable and comprehensive way and take simple things we already know and start breaking them down into meaningful classifications. I completely agree with you. And I hope that came out in some of my comments during the presentation. Well, we're looking forward to that. So I've got a couple more questions here. So uh, Dr. Pata was asking about the histological yield of small bowel Crohn's disease is low and how to overcome this unmet need. And what's your uh, viewpoint on this? Uh, if I'm understanding correctly, it's, a, it's the challenge that we face in, in getting a histological diagnosis when Crohn's disease is present in the mid small, small bowel. bowel or somewhere that's not easily reachable with standard endoscopic approaches. Uh, I agree that this is a big challenge. And uh, in some cases where it's not clear what we're treating or where the treatments are not working, we have to rely on either a deep enteroscopy approach, which I recognize isn't always available everywhere, um, or we have to actually in rare cases, but we do it, uh, send them for an exploratory laparotomy to actually get a diagnosis. And I think that given that we have expert colleagues who can do a laparoscopic uh, exam if we need them to, that we should rely on that when the diagnosis is unclear. Remember that the differential diagnosis of mid-small bowel stenosis can be multiple other things, including lymphoma. So I don't uh, adhere to the strategy of just throwing steroids and then using other treatments to these patients. I really push to try and get a clear diagnosis. Uh, and I think it's a very important topic. I would add to that question that even after you confirm the diagnosis of Crohn's in the mid-small bowel, you have to think about how do you monitor them? Uh, we know, for example, that MRI can be helpful, but it's not sensitive enough to pick up all the changes after therapy or progression after surgery. So we need to be thoughtful about ways to do this. There are some evolving and validated um, serologic measures, something called the Endoscopic Healing Index published in Gastroenterology last year, uh, which is a combination of 13 molecular markers of mucosal inflammation that you might use, but you have to confirm the diagnosis before you rely on something like that. Um, okay, I think maybe we'll ask one more question. So um, there's this whole thing on the root good score for post uh, for post-operative recurrence of Crohn's disease. But uh, according, uh, so the question is whether or not there's a need for a new score to address things like ileal recurrence, presumably proximal to uh, the anastomosis. Um, I think that has been sort of, you know, banded about before uh, and perhaps yeah. the role of capsule as well, if I'm not mistaken. Well, it's a very important question because despite the ubiquitous, ubiquitous use of the root geert score, um, we, it hasn't been prospectively validated at the level it needs to be, and that's going on now. And for areas that in the colon, for example, or more proximally, um, there, that the score has not been studied appropriately at all. And so there actually is right now an international group trying to develop some consensus statements, which will inform and create a roadmap for future research in this area. I think it's very important to have that. Uh, not just to have a score, but rather, of course, to understand progression and recurrence, because the major advance in IBD, in my opinion, has been the role of monitoring. Monitoring at the time you start therapy to make sure it's working, monitoring over time to make sure it continues to work, and monitoring as a proactive approach to disease management. I'm much more in favor of proactive disease monitoring than proactive drug monitoring. I think that the disease monitoring should inform whether you need to assess the drug. So uh, I agree that we need some better ways to do this. And given that we think more and more that IBD is a systemic disease that focuses partially on the gut, recognizing systemic markers that might be helpful would be uh, obviously more convenient and definitely necessary in our field. Thank you very much. So I think uh, in the interest of time, I think we're gonna stop there. I think, I, uh, I think uh, really uh, 
we all agree that that was a fantastic lecture. So I really want to thank Professor Rubin for making the time uh, really to uh, give this talk uh, for the first, our first IPD masterclass. Over to you, Rupa. Thank you, Vida. Thank you, Professor Rubin. And uh, with uh, our next session is actually the most interesting session. And uh, this is the cultural exchange, what we all aim to do at IBD ENC. And our theme country, this uh, first inaugural session is Nepal. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce our key member, Dr. Neerad Joshi from Nepal, a great friend even before I say that he's the head of gastroenterology at the Nepal Cancer Research hospital at uh, the GI center there. He's worked at the University of Wales. He has numerous publications. And as I mentioned before, a key member, a pillar of the IBD ENC. Over to you, Neeraj. Thank you, Rupa, for that kind introduction. And thank you for the fantastic meeting. Uh, I'm just gonna share my slide. Just bear with me a minute. Can you see my slide? Can you see my slide? Hello? Okay. You can you hear screen. me all right? Yes, it's looking all right. You can just make it full screen, Neeraj. Okay, there you go. Yeah. So I don't think I quite understood the remit I was given. I thought I was supposed to talk a little bit about IBD and do some cultural showcase of Nepal. But I, I didn't quite understand that that cultural showcase had to be somehow linked with IBD in Nepal. Is that right, Rupa? Okay, so first I'll talk a little bit about IBD, what we've been doing in Nepal, and then I'll go on to showcase Nepalese culture. So as you know, Nepal is a very small country, uh, sandwiched between two giants, China in the north and India in the south. And most of our terrain is hilly, and mountainous, and only 17% of the land is plain here in the southern parts of Nepal. And we have a very unique flag, which is the only non-rectangular flag in the world. And since we met in person a couple of years ago, uh, I'm very delighted to say that there are many reasons in Nepal which have now some sort of IBD service. And they're mostly in the eastern and southern parts of Nepal. The rest of Nepal, unfortunately, have to still rely on these shamans to ward off their evil spirit that bring on their IBD. So quite a lot of people rely on these people uh, for any kinds of ailments. And this is very much ingrained in our culture. These people provide patient-centered healthcare at patient's doorstep something that Professor Rubin can only dream of in Chicago. But whatever you think of them, what I can tell you is they score much better than I do when it comes to patient satisfaction. In Nepal, we have only 41 council recognized gastroenterologists for a population of 30 million. That makes roughly about one gastroenterologist for 750,000 people. And we have only two GI pathologists, so we have our work cut out. The incidence and prevalence of IBD is unknown. We have only two case series published so far, and they don't tell us very much, except for the fact that it's mostly younger people between 20 to 40 years of age, and mostly males who come to the hospital to get themselves treated and are included in these series. Elderly people, women are languishing out in the villages in far-flung areas. Is IBD different in Nepal? Well, we see a lot more UC than Crohn's. In fact, it's roughly about one third and two third. And almost all our Crohn's, almost all Crohn's are non-smokers. In terms of smoking, if you look at Nepalese culture, Nepal has one of the highest women smokers in the world. Almost all the rural Nepalese women smoke on a regular basis. And despite that, we don't see that many Crohn's in these people, whether it's underdiagnosed 
or whether it's actually not there is unknown. And we see very little perianal disease. And at one time I thought stricturing and fistulating disease is also rare. And I was told by Professor Norris but in one of the meetings that as we start seeing more and more Crohn's over the next few years, we'll be seeing more and more stricturing and fistulating disease and how right he was. And now over the past couple of years, I've been seeing more stricturing and fistulating disease, but we don't see much of upper GI Crohn's. What challenges we have, the same challenges as you have in South Asian countries. Is it infection? Is it IBD? Histology is a challenge because we've only got two GI pathologists. Often we get nonspecific colitis. MR enterography is virtually non-existent because our radiologists are not familiar with MR enterography and our surgeons lack experience in IBD. Topical treatment, again, is not readily available. In terms of patient-related ch challenges, follow-up is an issue. It might be because the terrain uh, is too unfriendly. We ha you have to travel two, three days to get IBD care. And we don't provide cure to the patient. That's why patients don't like coming back for follow-ups. And again, compliance is an issue because they prefer dietary restrictions to medicines. And surgery remains a taboo. So what a change since we met the last time. Topical treatment has taken off. Now we have a regular supply of topical treatment, albeit in selected areas. There is more experience with CT enterography. And we have a couple of well-trained GI histopathologists that has helped us a lot in terms of diagnosing these patients. We also have a well-trained colorectal surgeon who trained in the US and has come back to serve the Nepalese people. And I also fall back on my mentor, Barney Hawthorne from Cardiff University with my difficult Crohn's patients. And he has bailed me out a number of times. But this is not what I'm gonna talk about in detail today. What I'm here is to do a talk on Nepalese culture. And I've selected a particular festival which is indigenous to Kathmandu, very well, very little known outside of Nepal. It's the festival of Ratu Machindranath, the harbinger of rain. And this festival has some link with India as well. This is the festival started by my ancestors 1600 years ago, and we continue to enjoy it till today. If you look at Nepalese doors and windows, you'll find that serpents or snakes feature very prominently in them. If you get a closer view, the carvings always have some sort of uh, serpentine figures. And they are important because they are believed to be the harbinger of rain, they bring, they bring rain. It so happened according to the legend that we had a guru Goraknath who visited Nepal and he was quite miffed by the people of Nepal because he was not respected properly by the people of Nepal. So he sat on serpents preventing them from bringing the rain. So there was a huge drought here. So the King Narendra Dev, who ruled Nepal in the fifth century consulted his guru and they came up with the idea that they will have to bring Lord uh, Machindranath to Nepal. Machindranath happens to be the guru of Guru Goraknath. So when the guru arrives, you have to stand to pay your obeisance. As you stand, the snakes would then be released and there would be rain. And that's what they plan to do. So where does Lord Machindranath reside? He was born in a place called Kamaru Kamakya, which lies in modern day Assam in India. So the three people, the guru, the king and a porter traveled all the way from Nepal to this area in Kamaru Kamakya, the birthplace of Lord Machindranath and fest him to Nepal. And after the arrival of Lord Machindranath, Guru Goraknath had to stand to pay obeisance to his guru and the serpents were released and there was rain. And that's the story. And this is what we celebrate every year. And we've been doing that for the past 1600 years. What happens in the festival is we first start with the building of the chariot. It starts with the building of the wheels. The wheels are exchanged every 12 years. So we, we keep up with the driving uh, authorities guidance. So the wheels are changed every 12 years. 
and they're made at a certain place in Patan in the traditional way. Once the wheels are ready, they're worshipped and they're wheeled across the city to the place where the chariot is built. And you can see the brakes there. You can see the beautiful architecture in Nepal, but that's another story. Maybe in future exchanges, I could talk about these as well. Maybe link them to IBD. And here you can see the big wheels and the chariot is being built. The chariot is built very much the same way that it used to be built several hundred years ago. We don't use any nails. We don't use any hinges. And the wooden, structured, wooden structure are interlocked together. And we use ropes. To, to construct the chariot. So once the chariot is ready, then we put the idol in it. So they're trying to put the hat of the uh, idol at the top. No, oh, sorry. I, I think I... I jumped a little bit, sorry. So once the chariot is ready, they'll bring the idol to the chariot and that starts the festival. Once the chariot is ready, then we wheel it across the city. What I really like about this festival is there is a real buzz in the city. The noise and the hustle and the bustle is deafening. The cacophony of the noise produced by the traditional music and dances and the shouts of ha as they pull the chariot this adds to the ambience. So he's the leader. He's directing the people how to pull the chariot. The chariot is about uh, 18 meters high. You'll, you'll get to see the brakes as well in a minute. But here are the brakes. People just putting some, some sort of stumbling block on the chariot. And people have been crushed by the wheels and died on the spot. Yet the health and safety goes out of the window when we have this festival. It is believed that you go straight to heaven if you are crossed by the wheel of the chariot. I mean, the cacophony of the noise and the real fear of getting crossed or caught in the stampede just adds to the excitement. Not that I'm too keen to go to heaven. Uh, so if you're a real adrenaline junkie, this festival is for you. And this festival goes on for about a couple of months. Every day, a little bit of the chariot is pulled and people feast at the end of the day. And we also have what is called the Lakhe dance, the demon who used to terrorize the people of the Kathmandu Valley. And later he was tamed to protect the people of the Kathmandu Valley. So at the end of the day, after pulling the chariot across the street, we go home and feast on Nepalese cuisine. As you can see, there is a wide variety uh, adding to our microbiome. There is also lots of 
uh, processed food there, which I'm sure probably contributes to some degree of IBD in Nepal. There are many festivals in Nepal where you actually starve as a penance for your sins to appease the gods. This is one festival where you gorge yourself to appease the gods. And I quite like that idea. So I'll leave you with the last video just to showcase the entire festival. It's just a one minute video. We could go on and on. And uh, thank it's you over for, now. Thank you for showing us a different side of Nepal other than the Himalayas, which we always see. Thank you. Thank you very much, Neeraj. Okay, so that's that. Uh, yes, that was wonderful. Uh, we go straight on to our next session, and that is the A to Z of small bowel strictures. Over to you, Ida. Um, thank you very much. Um, Can you hear me now? Yeah, okay, that's better. Oh, Neeraj, that was uh, very exciting. I, I guess I'll do that instead of the San Fermin Festival in, uh, in uh, Pamplona next time if I want a little bit of excitement. Okay, so without any further ado, I'd like to introduce a good friend of mine, Professor Govind Makaria, who is a professor at the All India Institute of Medical Sciences, Delhi, India. He has published extensively, and in fact, one of the things that uh, Professor Rubin presented on intestinal tuberculosis and Crohn's disease was uh, Gobin's work, early works, uh, as well as some uh, uh, role of uh, ASCA um, in uh, not differentiating Crohn's disease and intestinal tuberculosis, if I recall ASCA, uh, if I recall Gobin. And honestly, um, he is also a key member of our Asia Pacific Gastroenterology Association working group in IBD. And we've published together, it's really, a great fun always, uh, just like uh, this uh, IBD ENC. And it seemed like only yesterday when we met each other as fairly young people in 2005 in Sydney. Um, without any further ado, uh, please welcome uh, Professor Govind Makaria. Uh, thank you, Ida, and thank you, Rupa, for a wonder wonderful invite. Uh, a long, long time, Ida, after seeing you, after a long time, and all of you. It is such a pleasure to see all of you uh, this uh, evening. Uh, Dr. Rupa, thank you very much for initiating this event that's called Masterclass in IBD. And I think this is a great uh, initiative by you and your group that we need to uh, spread the clinical force of uh, uh, providing quality care to our patients with uh, inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, Dr. Rivan, it was a wonderful talk and it's, it's wonderful listening to you. A uh, number of very important points we made. I think uh, uh, this is going to be uh, very useful for all our uh, audience. With this, uh, as Rupa said, that we need to talk about uh, the uh, talk about what is the A to Z of uh, small intestinal strictures. What are the causes, and uh, how do you achieve the diagnosis uh, in these patients? As we know that. Uh, in India, tuberculosis is very important difference for diagnosis of uh, Crohn's disease. Therefore, uh, we're going to focus a little bit on that aspect and take you through what are the important points you all like to remember while treating a patient with uh, Crohn's disease. As we know, there are multiple challenges uh, in small intestinal structures, starting from diagnosis. Then what are the best strategies to treat these patients? Uh, uh, we are going to focus today uh, uh, in this uh, discussion. For this, we have a very, uh, very, very, I would say, uh, learned uh, panelist uh, in this uh, uh, panel discussion. 
for that we have Dr. Matthew Philip. He's a, he's a dear friend. Matthew, uh, he is a, a senior consultant in Kochi. We have a Dr. Raju Sarma. Uh, he's a senior professor of radiology at uh, uh, Indian Institute of Medical Sciences and he's my dear, very, very dear colleague at Ames. We have Dr. Anuradha Sekharan. He's a uh, pathologist at AIG in Hyderabad. Doctor, uh, can you make a, a presentation full screen? I will. I will. Yes. Yes. So, Dr. Masood Rahman, let's welcome Dr. Rahman from Bangladesh. Again, his interest being IBD. He's also part of uh, IBD ENC. Uh, Dr. PC, uh, thank you very much for joining today evening. He's, he's a uh, IBD expert in in Thailand. Uh, Dr. Mohan Ramchandani is a very well known endoscopist uh, of our country of India, and he is uh, at AIG in, in Hyderabad. Dr. Pradeep uh, is a surgeon at AIG in Hyderabad, and Dr. Partha uh, again at AIG in, in Hyderabad. With this, let's go to a case. Uh, let me present a case uh, who came to us. Uh, sometime in 2019, but his symptoms started in 2013 when he had uh, episodes of recurrent intestinal pain, uh, multiple episodes. He also had chronic diarrhea. He also had weight loss and had lost appetite and but had no fever. With these symptoms, uh, between 2013 and 2015, he was uh, going to many physicians and also getting over-the-counter treatment, but no different investigations were done and no different treatment was provided to him. But over these two years, his symptoms kept worsening. When he went to a surgeon, uh, he underwent a lap surgery and uh, uh, he, was, he underwent appendicectomy. Other details of surgery are not available. Was there a resection of intestine? Uh, we are not aware about that. So between after the surgery, there was some improvement in symptoms, but uh, uh, but his symptom persisted. He used to have a recurrent intestinal colic, and he used to have recurrent episodes of diarrhea. He never gained weight, but uh, he he was not given any specific therapy uh, after uh, 12, 15, 2019. In 2019, he met a gastroenterologist uh, where he was investigated, and. Uh, at that point of time, his hemoglobin was 9.8, his albumin was 3.4, CRP was 20, and ESR was 35. With that differential of uh, recurrent intestinal pain and uh, diarrhea, he was investigated, and indeed, he underwent a colonoscopy. Colonoscopy showed the multiple longitudinal ulcers in the terminal ileum, and uh, the mucosa was edematous. Rest of the colon was normal, except for disease in the terminal allium. The biopsy of which showed uh, inflammatory changes. There was a chronic evidence of chronic colitis in the form of a crypt distortion, but there was no granuloma and, and there was no staining for acid for bacilli. With this, he was treated. Uh, he also underwent a CT uh, interrography, uh, which showed, uh, uh, we request of Raju Sarman to please uh, uh, read the CT and tell us uh, what the CT findings are here. And the Dr. Raju Sarma is a very esteemed radiologist uh, at our center. Uh, thank you, Govin. Uh, so this is the CT enterography of this patient that was done in uh, 2019. And uh, what we can see here is a long segment of the gut, which is uh, thickened and uh, it shows inflammation in the form of uh, distended basorector. Uh, supplying this uh, segment of bowel. It's a fairly long segment of uh, the gut, which is abnormal. It's a segment of the ileum, and uh, it shows mild upstream uh, dilatation. What we see on the axial images is a stratified uh, nature of uh, enhancement, which is seen here. It uh, has that bilaminar kind of uh, hyper enhancement because of uh, the inner layer showing you increased enhancement, and then there's submucosal edema suggesting uh, active inflammation. And uh, there is uh, a stricture as well with the mild upstream dilatation. So it suggests active inflammatory stricturing phenotype of uh, the disease, since there is definite upstream dilatation here as well. Over to you, Bowen. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sarma. 
Uh, so going on with this, he was treated and, and, and he was treated with some drug. We don't know the details about that. Most likely steroid. And with that, he has some improvement because he was not carrying prescriptions of what drug he was prescribed to. And he had partial relief from symptoms. With this, uh, despite treatment, his symptom persisted. And then he came for the first time uh, to our institutions in New Delhi uh, when he had a recurrent uh, uh, intestinal type of pain with obstructive features. He used to have a uh, kind of a partial obstruction. He had lost 10 kgs of weight over the last uh, six months uh, in 2000, after 2019. His hemoglobin was nine. Albin was further went from 3.4 to 2.3. IESR and high CRP. Therefore, he was evaluated at our center this point of time. So this is a master class. I thought I'd take some time uh, to take to talk a bit of basics <clears throat> of uh, evaluating such a patient. So this patient came with a recent intestinal colic and along with also has chronic diarrhea. It means this person has both uh, not only mucosal symptom, it also has luminal symptoms. Luminal symptom means there are some decrease in luminal diameter of intestine. And he had this patient has both evidence of mucosal and luminal disease. Let's take this story further, that uh, how do we know that uh, how much intestine is affected? In terms of, if somebody has a diffuse disease of uh, small intestinal mucosa, and which is non-ulcerated, if it's diffuse involvement, it means the diffuse disease of mucosa and no ulcerations, th the main symptom will be malabsorption. And patient will have all the features of malabsorption. If there are, in addition, there, if there's ulcerations, in addition to absorptive defects, they can also lose blood from the GI tract and also can lose protein from GI tract. And they can have features of bleeding, features of a protein losing entropy in these situations. But if the lesions are only partial, they are and not ulcerated, they, be, they may not be any manifestations in these patients. And this such kind of disease may remain completely unrecognized. The patient may not have any symptom. Therefore, also, if the disease is only patchy, involves only a small part of intestine, and but ulcerated, they will not be malabsorption, but they can be blood loss and they can be protein loss from these patients. With this, if furthermore, the question comes that if there's an intestinal stricture, at what level, we know the intestine is about 2.5 to 3 centimeter in diameter, at what level of stricture the symptom appear, at, the, at this level, or this level, or this level, or at this level. Or, although there are no human data, but there are data from animal studies which shows that if luminal diameter comes to less than 60%, then symptoms of obstruction starts appearing. So normal diameter is about three centimeter. If diameter goes to less than 1.5 or so, the symptom of intestinal obstruction or intestinal pain will start. Also uh, to know that these symptoms uh, may be less marked if, uh, with the intestinal structure in small intestine because small intestine content is liquid. Therefore, there may not be much symptom. With this background, uh, let's come back to what the patient has. This is a young person who had a recurrent abdominal pain. It's so 8 o'clock. This is of intestinal obstructive symptoms, had chronic diarrhea, had anemia, had a low albumin, and also has low globulin, suggesting that there has a protein losing state. He has a longitudinal ulcers in the terminal ileum. He also has a long segment structure uh, in the uh, terminal ileum, and he underwent a surgical intervention, certainly appendicectomy, but what other part of intestine was dissected, we are not sure. With it, let me ask uh, my dear colleague, uh, Dr. Matthew Phillip, and also comments from Dr. Rahman and Dr. Pise, that what would you think that what this patient has? Thank you, uh, Dr. Makaria, for the <clears throat> interesting case. And I would like to thank the platform of IBD ENC for uh, bringing in such uh, wonderful speakers like Professor uh, Rubin, who has given an excellent lecture on the diagnostic uh, aspects of IBD. And I, in coming to our case, I think the possibility is because, as already you discussed, it's a long duration symptom and a chronic diarrhea with weight loss and intestinal stricture. I think, you know, two diagnoses will come to my mind. One is that since the patient is from India, naturally I have to bring in tuberculosis. The point again, sir, there is no fever and a very long duration of symptoms. 
and the CT shows multiple strictures at uh, different levels. So my option will be that I'm, am I dealing with a case of IBD in the form of Crohn's disease? So between TB and Crohn's, I would prefer more to label this as a Crohn's disease. Thank you, Govind. Uh, Dr. Rahman, any comment from you? Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Govind, and uh, uh, thanks, Dr. Rupa, for organizing the meeting. And uh, I'm also grateful and thankful to Dr. Robin for wonderful lecture. Uh, I agree with uh, Dr. Matthew Phillips that uh, considering the deviations and the findings, uh, first diagnosis should be the Crohn's disease uh, because uh, it doesn't have any other features, constitutional features like fever, respiratory symptoms, and even the biopsy doesn't show any granuloma. And uh, I'm not sure whether other tests like quantifier gold test, Montus test, chest X-ray has already been done to explore the tuberculosis. Uh, please say any comment. You, you, I mean, this uh, both tuberculosis and Crohn's disease are important disorders in our continent. Therefore, uh, what would be your opinion? So, uh, uh, my, in my opinion, uh, this is a uh, uh, case of the Crohn's disease. But uh, uh, all the all the investigations should be done to exclude the possibility of tuberculosis, considering the hyperendemic area for tuberculosis in our uh, in our scenario or in our situations. Right. So, pieces. Any comment from uh, your experience from Thailand? Yeah, I think, yeah, because it's a long segment of stricture, so it's make uh, other cause like instead anastomotic stricture, patient or malignancy or radiation is less likely. So the main uh, difference is it should be Crohn's disease or tuberculosis. I agree. Yeah. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, I think this is a. Uh, I think all of you agree uh, at this point of time that uh, it's most likely Crohn's disease. But just for mm -hmm. sake of uh, discussion, uh, let me also take this uh, discussion further. That what uh, maybe I may ask Dr. Matthew Philip that his experience uh, and or the view of literature. Uh, what are the causes of strictures in small intestine, and what basic investigation one should do uh, in such patients? See, when we suspect uh, uh, a patient uh, coming to us with uh, suspected intestinal strictures. I think the most important thing is that uh, we need to have an imaging to find out the extent of the disease as well as uh, the type or the level of the stricture and number of strictures, et cetera, or associated finding. I'm sure that Raju, Dr. Professor Raju will add on to that. So when you get a, a case of uh, stricture, I think you know the imaging, especially the cross-section imaging will help you to differentiate between the different types of causes for that. And uh, uh, the Professor Raju himself has published that article where you get uh, stricture with limb nodes, especially limb nodes which has got uh, uh, necrotic limb nodes that will go in favor of tuberculosis. That I will remove that. So to me, the stricture, you have benign causes and malignant causes. And for the patient whom we are discussing now, I think it is a benign cause and it has to be either a tuberculosis or Crohn's disease. And because of the nature of the type of the uh, strictures, long strictures, multiple, I would prefer more in favor of a Crohn's disease. <clears throat> and uh, uh, how to differentiate, uh, you want me to tell at this stage or you, uh, it will come in the uh, this further discussion? We can do it a bit later. So uh, just to say that uh, the strictures are multiple, it's not only Crohn's and tuberculosis, that we need to know that uh, the background of, uh, I mean, if there's background, it could be ischemic strictures, it could stick to it because of drugs, like especially non steroidal yes, drugs. This could be uh, uh, because of uh, vasculitis. This could be also because of uh, uh, mitosis or malignancies. So the cause of strictures are multiple, but we have to collate all the clinical information uh, to make a clinical differential diagnosis. Moving further, so as, as uh, Dr. Matthew Phillips says, that if you have a patient like this who has come with a small intestinal uh, pain, different intestinal obstructive pain, and also has diarrhea, what are the principles of investigation? Three principles. First, what is the disease? And you, you need to know what the luminal aspect of disease. You want to look at mucosal aspect of the disease. You want to look at histology, at what is the disease process, which is uh, responsible for uh, mucosal and luminal disease. Furthermore, you want to look at effective disease. Effective disease means that uh, what all this has led to, like uh, it led to anemia, it led to proteinuria neuropathy, it leads to 
weight loss, so that if you look quantify effect of disease, and lastly, look at what are the causes of this disease. And in that regard, so we need to do histology and microbiological tests. With these three principles of finding out the disease, finding out the effect of disease, and also what are the cause of disease. So we need to keep these principles in our mind while investigating these patients. So now coming first to what is the disease and, and how to investigate a small interest on luminal aspect. And for that, certainly we do a luminal imaging. So maybe we have multiple questions on this and I have, I have a, a pointed out some of the important clinical questions, especially what are what is ideal imaging? Is it a, only CT, CT scan or, or you do CT intrography or MR intrography? And the many other question which I've pointed out here, maybe I request Dr. Rajesh Sharma uh, to take up uh, uh, each one of them and tell us uh, more about it. I think this is a very, very important once you see patients like uh, what we're just saying today evening. So, uh, Govind, if you allow me to share my screen, I'll do this with the help of some slides and examples. I will, I will. I'll stop sharing my screen. You can share the screen now. Can you share the screen? Sima? I'm not able to see when I click on share screen, I'm not able to see my desktop at all. So, so Dr. Rupa, can you uh, allow Dr. Sarma to share the screen? Already. Somebody from the technical team at AIG? Already allowed, sir. So, uh, Yeah, I'm just going to I'm just going to try it again one more time. I, I think you have to stop sharing yours. Have you done that? Go you have, yeah. I did. I did. I did. Yes. We can see your, your computer. Uh, only thing slides need to come here. Is my slide visible? Yes, yes. So the role of imaging in uh, IBD is to diagnose the presence of IBD and uh, then come to a differential diagnosis between the important entities that have been alluded to earlier, tuberculosis, Crohn's, uh, NSAID-induced strictures, ischemic uh, and vasculitis, and there are imaging features which can help you to uh, decide that differential. Assess the disease activity, comment on the presence of strictures, decide is it a dominantly inflammatory stricture or fibrotic stricture, and identify complications like obstruction, fistulas, abscesses, and perianal disease, which can be done very well with MR. You can also evaluate extra intestinal manifestations in the setting of IBD, like uh, the presence of primary sclerosing cholangitis, sacroilitis, all that can also be very well evaluated using the technique of uh, MR. In our country, we often couple that with a chest CT to pick up associated pulmonary tuberculosis because we are always, uh, we have this in the back of our mind, could we be dealing with uh, bowel tuberculosis, which is phenotypically very similar to Crohn's. And we also routinely do a chest CT before biological therapy is instituted because even latent tuberculosis becomes very important in this context. And a new and emerging role for imaging is also to assess the response to therapy uh, the two cross-sectional imaging tools that we have at our disposal are CT entrography and MR entrography. And the critical step in both is to achieve good bowel distension because collapsed bowel can mimic pathology. MR provides us multiple paradigms and I won't have the time to go into all the details, but we can get multiple sequences and multiple paradigms to assess the presence of ulceroconstrictive disease. If you ask me which is the best technique uh, that we have in radiology, it is certainly MR entrography. These are young patients, we want to avoid radiation. The disease has a relapsing and remitting course and therefore repeated imaging is often required. And again, you want a tool which does not involve ionizing radiation. It provides us multiple parameters for disease evaluation, including the T2 signal of the gut, the contrast kinetics, diffusion weighted imaging and assess motility. And I'll try and show some examples of that as well. MR is also ideal for assessing perianal disease, which can be seen in up to a quarter of uh, these patients. If we compare CT and MR entrography, CT provides good spatial resolution, whereas MR has a much higher contrast resolution. 
MR, as I referred to, provides you multiple paradigms of uh, evaluation. Having said that, the advantages of CT are that it is a much shorter exam. It can provide consistent image quality, is easier to interpret, whereas MR entrography has a much longer learning curve, and you have to pay very meticulous attention to detail if you want a good quality, reproducible quality of uh, MR. So where, how do we decide whether we should do a CT entrography or MR entrography? In the ideal world, probably every patient who needs cross-sectional imaging should have an MR entrography. But logistic considerations do not always allow that in resource-constrained environment. And therefore, if the patient comes to us for the first time with bowel symptoms, does not have an established diagnosis of Crohn's, we actually begin with a CT entrography because that helps us to rule out all other kinds of pathology that you may be uh, looking for in these patients as well. All the follow-up studies should then be done using MR entrography. And also, if the first CT is equivocal, then we still resort to doing an MR entrography in these patients. We did, along with the Indian Society of Gastroenterology, publish some guidelines on the evaluation of uh, Crohn's in the Indian context. And let me now show you some examples. The findings in active inflammatory Crohn's are that you get this kind of stratified uh, pattern of enhancement with thickening of the bowel wall. And you get uh, what is called as the comb sign. These are the distended vasorecta supplying this thickened segment of gut. And this again shows you a long segment involvement of the ileum with the inflammation and this kind of laminar appearance of enhancement with upstream, marked upstream dilatation because of stricture. This is another example of a stricture in the proximal jejunum with upstream dilatation and uh, active, angry looking ileal stricture in this patient. For quantifying disease activity, we do have multiple scores on MR as well. We have the uh, MARIA score, the MEG score, but these are not routinely employed because they are time consuming and they're usually done in the setting of either clinical trials or research studies. What we try and assess is the T2 signal of the gut, the pattern of enhancement and diffusion restriction. I'll show you that with some examples. So this is uh, the T2 signal of the gut, the thickened bowel wall shows you T2 hyperintensity because of the edema in the bowel wall, and that suggests active inflammation. Stratified appearance of enhancement we've talked of earlier are all uh, harbingers of active inflammation, and also multiple perianal fistula with complex tracts can be seen in this patient. These are some more examples showing you the typical hyperintensity in the thickened bowel wall. And this is a diffusion weighted image where if you get bright signal on your high B value, this also suggests active inflammation. Another very important finding, which is the correlate of the pathology in these patients, is the asymmetric involvement of the gut. There is preferential involvement of the mesentric border of the gut, whereas the anti-mesentric border is relatively spared. You can see that the thickening as well as the hyper-enhancement is involving the mesentric border. So it's a very asymmetric involvement of the bowel loop and a very long segment involvement as is seen in this loop of thickened ileum. When we look at a stricture, people have defined what a stricture should be. It, it is luminal compromise of greater than 50%, upstream dilatation more than three centimeters. And this has been further defined, uh, refined in some studies by adding that the wall thickness should be increased by more than 25% of the baseline. You can then try and do a cine imaging as well. And this is the uh, cine loop that uh, Dr. David Rubin was alluding to. You can run a sequence in the cine loop and you can show if there is a fixed narrowing as is seen in this segment of ileum. You can differentiate it that this does not open up in any of the phases and therefore this is an organic stricture and not a wave of uh, peristalsis. Between inflammatory and fibrotic strictures, there are some findings. I won't have the time to go into all the details, but the signal intensity helps you. Inflammatory strictures are T2 bright, whereas fibrotic strictures are T2 dark. Fibrotic strictures show you progressive enhancement on the delayed images, and uh, also they show homogeneous enhancement as against the stratified enhancement of active inflammatory strictures. So suffice to say that there are many features which can help the radiologist to differentiate between inflammatory and fibrotic strictures. This is the typical appearance of an inflammatory stricture, whereas fibrotic strictures show you this kind of homogeneous enhancement without any stratification. This is the appearance of a inflammatory stricture in the terminal ileum, which with treatment, this is after treatment, all this enhancing thickening has gone, but there is fibrotic tissue left behind, which is causing upstream dilatation. So the inflammatory stricture has evolved into a fibrotic stricture, which can be seen in this CINE study here, that there is a stricture in the terminal ileum with upstream dilatation. We can also pick up the penetrating phenotype of the disease. And whenever we see this kind of a stellate appearance, this suggests that there is 
likely to be an enteroenteric fistula. And these are almost always associated with strictures, which can be very hard to identify because you don't get much dilatation in this context because the bowel is decompressed due to the enteroenteric fistula. We can, of course, if you see mast-like thickening, gross thickening more than 1.5 centimeters, you start suspecting could there be a malignancy getting superimposed over uh, Crohn's disease. I think I'm gonna stop there, uh, Govind, in the interest of time and hand it back to you. Yeah, stop saving us, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so coming back to the case again, uh, so at this point, let me ask uh, uh, two points with this that he also underwent, maybe also asked Dr. Rajesh Sarma to read the, I can share my screen. So uh, the point uh, Dr. Sama made, and, and it's very important, and uh, I, I think this is the effective point. Whenever you want to image small intestine, always do CT intography, not CECT. In CECT, you don't see lumen properly. Therefore, always, always, and always think of doing a CT intography or MR intography rather than CECT or uh, MRI. With that, uh, uh, let's look at uh, what this patient also underwent a repeat scintigraphy at uh, AIMS when he came to us. And again, I request Dr. Rajesh Sarma, if you can uh, read this slide and tell us uh, what all he had this point of time in March 2020. So we see that the findings have uh, essentially worsened, actually. There is, again, although I won't be able to show you the entire length of the stricture in this one image, we have to see serial images sitting on the workstation for that but you do have this uh, segment of uh, thickening here with enhancement. And upstream to this, again, there is mucosal hyperenhancement. There is increase in the caliber of the gut. And there's also evidence of stasis. You can see this kind of uh, fecalization or uh, the small bowel feces sign where you have this, uh, this suggests stasis because of this uh, stricture here. Other manifestations of stasis are the fact that there are enteroliths forming here the upstream gut is dilated significantly, and the appearance of uh, this uh, con the bowel contents here is more like colon because of the stasis, and this is referred to as a small bowel PC sign. And then again, you have this kind of a stratified, laminated appearance of enhancement. You do have some small lymph nodes, but the lymph nodes are smaller than a centimeter in size, and they do not show any central necrosis. There is a prominent distended vasorector, so again, uh, one would suggest that there is a stricture which probably now has a component of both active inflammation as well as fibrosis setting in because that's a continuum and there's probably both because the upstream dilatation has progressed significantly. There's a lot of evidence of stasis in the gut. So Thank you and over to you, Govind. Uh, so again, I saw the only the uh, images which have been representative uh, in this patient and just the bowel was normal. He also had a bit of colonoscopy and which showed only uh, distal allium in the terminal ileum, he had a, a longitudinal ulcer. With that, uh, maybe just uh, I also invite uh, some comments from uh, Dr. Rajo Sama again, that would you like to do a just CT once you do a CT intercopy in such patients? Yeah, so as I said earlier, we do land up doing a chest CT very often, especially when there is a close differential of tuberculosis to pick up supportive evidence of lung tuberculosis or any mediastinal lymph nodes in these patients. And we also want to pick up any evidence of latent uh, TB so that if uh, something like infliximab has to be started, they can be put on INH prophylaxis. And this patient, the CT was normal. The CT was normal. This point is important because there are three studies, uh, one from uh, the three studies from India, and all suggest that almost 8 to 10 percent of patients who are given biologic develop a reactivation of tuberculosis. Therefore, it's very important that in all such patients with IBD, if you're thinking of using uh, immunosuppressive therapy and biologics, you must rule out uh, tuberculosis in. So with, with that, uh, he was, since he had come to us with the acute intestinal obstruction, uh, his X-ray showed air fluid level. He was treated like a patient having acute intestinal obstruction using uh, IV fluids and IV antibiotics. With that, his obstruction improved. He was put on steroid for, for IV steroid for five days, followed by or the steroids. In addition, he was also given exclusive internal nutrition, which also has become a part of, of uh, a part of uh, treatment of uh, inflammatory Crohn's disease. With this management with steroid and uh, 
in uh, internal nutrition, exclusive internal nutrition, uh, he patient improved and he was discharged this point of time with orders to added 40 mg per day uh, for two weeks over time, steroid were tapered off and he was put on the thigh frame. So furthermore, uh, he was planned, we plan to give biologics uh, to this person because he had a aggressive course. But uh, with that time, there was a COVID outbreak uh, globally and uh, he could not come to us uh, uh, during that uh, pandemic. But he was followed up regularly, uh, telefo telephonically. Uh, he was maintained on the type in 100 milligram per day, that is two milligram per kg per day. Uh, oral steroids were tapered off, and but as steroids were tapered off, his symptoms appeared, and we called him back uh, even during pandemic uh, to come to us, and he was admitted uh, uh, in May 2020, and uh, even at that point of time, he was not able to tolerate even liquids. So his X-ray was done that point of time and showed a typical intestinal obstruction. So he was in already in obstruction when he came to us for the second time. So how do you plan of uh, management these patients who had uh, inflammatory intestinal disease, most likely Crohn's disease, and how would you treat? Two, con two important pillars of treatment is diet and, and uh, what drugs. What drug would like to use in this patient? And we'll discuss these two important clinical points uh, in a minute time. First, coming to diet, the what, how do you treat this patient during the acute phase? What is the role of uh, uh, exclusive internal nutrition in those patients who come with intestinal structure? And for that, uh, let me invite uh, uh, Dr. Namata Singh, who is a nut nutritionist, and uh, he is working at uh, All Indian Institute of Medical Sciences, and she's our colleague. So Dr. Namata, can you please uh, tell us uh, uh, about this. Uh, so can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, you can hear you, yes. Uh, okay. okay sir. So uh, if this uh, patient has complete obstruction, then we would uh, not resort to any diet, we would resort to BPN. But if uh, there is a partial obstruction, then for this patient, we should plan a, a low fiber diet. And uh, when I say this low fiber, we have to tell the patients many other things because with fiber, they restrict the spices, they restrict the oils, they restrict the sugars, and hence patient is just on some juices or some narial pani, which is not nutrition, but it is only fluids. So if we have to plan a low fiber diet for this patient. What I would do is that I would include all the seven important food groups and those food groups would, would be cereals, pulses, milk and curd, oils and sugars, oils, sugars, fruits. And if the patient is uh, non-vegetarian, then I would add some eggs also to it. Now, in each food group, we have two types of foods included one which has a high fiber and one which has a low fiber. Suppose we take cereals. In cereals, rice is low fiber, but wheat, if we take, it's high fiber. If we take semolina, it is low fiber. If we take dahlia, it is high fiber. So now from each food group, I would pick up those foods which are low in fiber and then plan a diet which is like a in a semi-solid or liquid consistency and then I would give to this patient. Uh, in this, I would like to add that there are certain fruits like banana. If it is uh, given like a, uh, like, a, like a milkshake, like a banana shake or a mango shake, so now the milk component is also going and the fruit component is also going. So we have to plan diet in a semi-solid or a liquid consistency. Now, as far as uh, milk is concerned, we would just like to see the tolerance of this patient. And if we feel that the patient is able to tolerate milk, then milk would be a very good option in his diet because it would in, help us to make up the protein intake. And in that milk, we could give many preparations like, like shakes, like uh, sweet dishes, like kheers, like uh, rasgulla, like rasmalais. 
sorry for using the indian terms the indian uh, sweets that we use and all this could meet the patient's requirement so this was about the diet in this patient we would go on a low fiber uh, semi solid liquid diet and at regular intervals at lesser frequencies so should i speak about the exclusive enteral nutrition also now before you do that i think there's a very important point that namita you made that all those patients have interesting structure it's not a short duration disease this is a long duration disease and therefore once there's a structure patient is fed a normal diet the patient will have pain and therefore patient restrict their own intake we as a physician must keep in mind that uh, we need to modify dietary therapy uh, we need to modify his diet at least in the consistency or in the forms that patient can take adequate nutrition balanced diet is very important but it's a chronic disease it's not disease of one week or two week or three weeks or four weeks it's a chronic disease therefore nutrition is very important and, and we believe that nutrition in ibd is one of the one of the point, one of the important uh, uh, important challenges uh, in our country that uh, uh, we need to treat we need to train our physicians at this in mindset that nutrition in ibd is a very very important and dr mita told that uh, give all seven types of food patient needs for complete nutrition but change their form make them more liquid make them more more semi form so that uh, uh, and uh, put no fibers in that so that the uh, feed can go directly even through stricting segment of intestine with that there is also emerging role of uh, exclusive intranutrition in especially in acute chronic disease those who come with uh, obstructive features and uh, dr ramata can with time will probably not allow us to uh, discuss in detail just a couple of lines uh, what forms uh, how do you do Exclusive. Okay. So, so uh, this is the new monitor. concept that has uh, come up that if we do the exclusive enteral nutrition, our patients will of CD will improve. So uh, it's very simple calculation. We have to calculate the requirement of the patient, and for the requirement of the patient, we need the height and weight. And uh, surprisingly, in our case, we don't have the height and weight, which is so very important to assess. that what the nutritional status of the patient is so if we have the height and weight we can calculate the bmi and based on that bmi then we can uh, do the factorial method and that factorial method will range from 20 kilo calories per kg to 40 kilo calories uh, per kg depending on the bmi if the bmi is less than 16 we'll go up to 40 kilo calories per kg but if the bmi is uh, is high then we will go low on the calories of 20 kilo calories per kg and uh, once we have calculated the requirement that means how much of calories and protein has to be high so usually it is around 1.2 to 1.5 grams per kg body weight so once we have calculated the energy and protein we have to choose a, a suitable formula so now there are two categories of formulas that we can give one is the semi elemental type of formula which is not very good in taste because the uh, proteins are in the peptide forms and the uh, and the taste is not very good the cost is very high so uh, uh, the polymeric formulas can also be tried what is the difference between polymeric and semi elemental in polymeric the carbohydrate protein and fat are in the complex forms and uh, uh, okay so if once we have decided the uh, requirement then usually one uh, box which is 400 grams of the uh, enteral formula ha usually has to be given over a period of one day because the requirement is between 1600 calories to 2000 calories so if we have to give 400 grams over a period of 24 hours so usually we give 50 grams of that powder in around 150 to 200 ml of water and to be taken every 2 hourly so this is about reconstitution of the uh, the enteral formula and then we did a, uh, there was a study which was done by our department in which we saw the efficacy and tolerability of exclusive enteral nutrition in adult patients with complicated crohn's disease and in this we had included 31 patients in short uh, in this in short uh, yes and so here we see that 
we if we wanted to see what was the effectiveness of the EEN, so we did a retrospective analysis of uh, to 31 patients who were given EEN, and the parameters studied were uh, clinical response, clinical remission, and the albumin and hemoglobin levels. We studied over a period of four weeks and eight weeks, and we saw that the uh, clin the, uh, the index the cdai reduced uh, in 8 weeks and the albumin increased in 8 weeks so we we found that this was effective in crohn's disease een perfect thank you dr namita singh and uh, you made a point that uh, one can use een in some of these patients now coming to uh, one, second part once of diet second is now what drug do you use again this is not a uh, I think it's a very important uh, aspect that uh, in acute intestinal obstruction, as this patient came with, what drug would you use? Steroids and azathioprine, followed by azathioprine, or use biologics. And if biologics, which one do you use? We have a three drug available in our country, infliximab, vitalimab, or rosumab. So what shall you do? Maybe ask Dr. Philip uh, if you have any comment to make this point of time. Say, uh, uh, Govind. Uh, this patient has got acute intestinal obstruction. The presentation is like that. You know? So I think you know we need to manage the patient in that aspect with uh, um, naso uh, gastric acidation and then uh, um, parental nutrition. And once the patient improves, then you gradually increase the patient nutrition as uh, uh, Professor Namal has told you increase the nutrition. Regarding treatment, as such, there is no obvious studies. In acute ulcerative, severe ulcerative disease, we have, we know that biologic circuit we have. But in a patient with the stricturing disease and patient is in acute intestinal obstruction, what is the role of biology? Nobody knows. But in patients, what we do, once the patient to be managed with or decompress the patient on acute intestinal obstruction, then we try to give them on steroids. <clears throat> and uh, uh, probably on the evolution of recovery, we start giving them biologics also. I think, you know, Professor Rubin can actually uh, uh, comment on this on patient with the intestinal obstruction of Crohn's disease, what is the role of biologics? Otherwise, we start with steroids, and when the patient improves, then we give uh, biologics of this patient. Of course, we start them on asoran once they clinically improve, otherwise, it is difficult. Uh, certainly, mm -hmm. so in acute, uh, acute intestinal obstruction, we do not use generally biologic, we don't start with biologic, oh. but start it on, on steroid and followed by. Brain. So with that, uh, he he improved, and and now I think we'll come back to this in a minute time. So after he improved, he was discharged, but uh, on follow up, he was found to have a COVID positive, but uh, uh, he had only mild symptom and he recovered from that. He was again came back uh, when he again had one more episode of intestinal obstruction after he had steroid uh, steroid tapered off, again came with obstruction. This time again, he was treated with uh, uh, EEN, uh, nutrition, but uh, he could not tolerate it, but he was given TPN. Again, he was given IV steroid, but this time there was no response to steroid. And, 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 uh, and then he was uh, planned that we must operate him and remove his, uh, uh, remove his uh, 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 restricting segment for improvement uh, in his uh, symptoms. We, we, we come back to that, uh, this point, what was done for him. But again, the point I, we want to make that uh, in acute intestinal obstruction, we do not use biologics. And some data on biologic on stricting Crohn's disease, and this is a Creole study. Maybe Dr. Partha is here. Dr. Partha want to comment on uh, this study. What is the effect of, uh, effect of uh, biologic in stricting Crohn's disease? Yes, sir. Partha? Can you share my screen? Yes, can you share your screen? You, I think we could bring you back on their screen later, but you okay. can just make a comment out here that uh, yeah. what what would be, uh, yeah, so, what do you uh, think? Okay. Uh, regarding medical therapy or of, of fibrostenosing Crohn's disease, there are uh, no such therapy uh, which is known to alter the natural course of the stenosing Crohn's disease. And this Creole study, which was um, actually done by the gated uh, Creole study group, from uh, the French group and Italian group uh, that was published in GUT 2019. In that, 97 patients with Crohn's disease and obstructive symptoms were studied. And the response to aralimumab was in two-third of patients of symptomatic stricture at 24 weeks. Response was prolonged in one-third till the end of follow-up, that is four years. 
and half of the patients were free of surgery at four years after treatment initiation. So you can take it as a, a optimistic thing like uh, we have prevented 50 percent patients from surgery or you can be pessimistic seeing that 50 uh, percent patient underwent surgery. So based on this study they have predict, uh, made a score, predictive score whether this anti-TNF is going to work or not. Uh, this is a study from uh, Leuven, Belgium uh, by the Severin Vermeerer group which have sh who have shown that the symptomatic bowel stenosis, uh, if this Bacardi, this is the acronym for B3 disease, anti-TNF exposure, CAR50 not to mutation and uh, dilatation, pre stenotic dilatation and inflammation that is CRP more than 11, then the patient if the score uh, for each of the points score is one point is given and if the total point and pre for pre stenotic dilatation two points are given. So, uh, if the patient has six points, patient goes for surgery directly. If the patients have four to five points, then a patient should go for surgery if the acceptable uh, surgical risk is there. The score is two to three, the patient should go undergo medical therapy and reassessment and six to 12 months. If the score is zero to one, the option is medical therapy. Then these are the clinical predictors of response. Uh, these are derived from the Creoli study. That is less than 40 years of age, L3 ileocolonic location, concomitant steroids and immunosuppressants, obstructive symptoms less than five weeks and Crohn's disease obstructive score which the authors have uh, uh, described that is based on actually the abdominal pain and clinical signs and hospitalization and dietary intake. If it is more than four, then it is uh, said to be good predictors of anti tnf response. And these are the MR enterography predictors of non-response that is stricture more than 12 centimeter long, small luminal diameter, increased wall thickness, ulceration, free stenotic dilatation more than 30 mm and marked delayed enhancement which uh, signifies fibrotic stricture and presence of abdominal fistulae. So uh, these are the clinical and radiological predictors of anti-TNF response. And there is some uh, newer studies uh, published last month in yes, Journal of Crohn's Colitis. Uh, they have showed, uh, they have got some data in Crohn's disease patient post hoc study. They have shown that also uh, this infliximab and ustikinumab, they have uh, in non-passable strictures in 62.5 percent of patients after 52 weeks this non-passable strictures either they become passable or uh, the strictures have resolved. So this is an interesting data although vedolizumab does not work because uh, in fibrostenosing Crohn's disease. So this is ab all about uh, the biologics uh, in uh, obstructive Crohn's disease. Thank you. Uh, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, Dr. Matthew. Oh, sorry. Yeah. See, I just want to make a short comment in this patient. No? See, no. when a patient comes with acute intestinal obstruction, in a Crohn's disease. And if I am sure, it is not the inflammatory structure. It is actually a fibrostenotic structure. My intention is actually to go for surgery in this patient at Green some theory. point. If it is recurrent, then I will definitely go for surgery because that is more cost effective. And I, we know that uh, the uh, biologically is not going to benefit uh, even the steroids. Uh, so then, very limited. If you are sure that, I think uh, Raju Sharma will uh, probably, he will tell us whether it's an inflammatory one or it's a fibrostenotic one. Thank you so much. Right. So again, we, now we have a data that one can use strictures, but somebody had a huge biologics, but somebody had a multiple obstruction because of stricture, you, you would like to do a surgery in this patient. And therefore, this is what really happened to this patient. Uh, uh, we had uh, this patient who had a recurrent resource intestinal obstruction, two times admitted, no response, no great response to steroid. We could not give biologic because of COVID times and he could not afford biologics. So he underwent surgery. Before we go to what we did, Maybe I take a comment, quick comment from Dr. Pradeep, who is, who is a GI surgeon at AIG. Uh, what are his opinion and what kind of surgery he would do in such a patient? Pradeep? Uh, so, the thing that matters in the case, uh, to me, it looks more like a fibrotic structure. So, I don't think uh, the biologics are going to be of much benefit because there's been long standing uh, structure and the MRI shows like more of a fibrotic structure. So, the only issue for us, for me, would be as a surgeon, would be this patient is nutritionally very bad, his uh, abdomen is very low. Uh, so, I do not know if I have enough time because to bring up his nutrition, it can take at least for me to do about two, three weeks of time, even if it is due uh, in real nutrition, supplemented with the medical nutrition. So, the other option for me is to explore this patient and I might avoid anastomosis. I just being a strong man, I stage the disease so that I tidy up the crisis of uh, relieving the obstruction 
but also decrease the morbidity of a leak which can happen in this patient depression with the patient. In the patient. So I do a stoma and a mutual fistula, and then I go in once the patient stabilizes or uh, reduces then after at least a three to four weeks after the mutation is built up, and then I restore the condition and continue. Okay. Thank you so much, Sohi. He asked for nutritional rehabilitation. He underwent uh, a part of the A long segment of uh, thickening was seen, starting from 20 centimeters from IC junction and proximally. Uh, proximally and proximal loop was dilated. 20 centimeter of segment of intestinal structure uh, was uh, dissected and double loop aliostomy was made. And, and this segment of the resected uh, underwent histological evaluation, which shows uh, features of chronic active uh, highlighting, uh, both superficial and deep ulcerations, which are long in uh, their appearance. We had a pyloric metaplasia, had some because of fibrosis, and uh, Inflammatory, uh, uh, inflammatory activity are uh, almost three to the muscular layer. Importantly, he will also had a changes of inflammation at the resected margin. Although all the visible disease was resected, but on histology, there was similar changes of inflammation at the resected margin. So now, after you have removed the disease, the question comes that, uh, what do you do next? So for this episode, he was discharged. And after treatment, uh, he gained weight and uh, 50 kg weight and had no obstructive symptoms. But the question comes, uh, what would you do in such patient? Would like to give several maintenance therapy, although you have removed the disease, but remember they, the receptor segment still had inflammatory uh, element available. So what would you, who are the patient in whom you give maintenance therapy? What kind of therapy you give? How do you monitor this patient? And maybe ask, uh, First to Dr. Matthew Philippe, and then coming from Dr. Rahman and from uh, PC. See, uh, <clears throat> I will just uh, comment on, uh, 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 are you able to hear me? Yes, yes, nothing. Uh, I, I, I thought you know, I'll just comment about, uh, we have to find out the pretty case of uh, recurrence in those patients when you do a surgery in patients. So, so, so. <laughs> it is found that even if you have a limited disease and you resect that, Actually, this is a disease which can involve any part of the intestine. And it could be even a systemic disease as we know that. So if the patient requires treatment. And for that, you can use uh, techniques to find out whether there's any recurrence or not, or you actually find out that whether the patient has got some predictors or not. In the Western countries, smoking is found to be a very important factor, but in India, it is not. And uh, those patients who have got perianal disease, they are very likely to have recurrence. So this patient definitely requires treatment. Then perforating phenotype, what would be the type of slicing disease and very extensive small world disease which our patient had and uh, whether the patient had a history of prior intestinal resection again that indicates treatment then there is a number of granulomas if uh, i am sure the pathologist will help us say granulomas uh, uh, also indicates probably it's a worse disease and then if the patient did not receive any uh, prophylactic treatment after surgery that also the patients are likely to have uh, this is a predictor of recurrence. So in those patients with a severe disease, I think the patient should be treated. If the patient has got only very limited disease and you have resected and the resected margin is absolutely totally free of any disease, very unlikely, but it can happen. And in those patients, probably you can, if it is an accessible area, you can actually go and see and look for uh, recurrence as what we do is a uh, uh, scoring system by which you actually start uh, examining these patients after six months or so, and then you classify accordingly and then you can treat. But I think in our patient, the patient requires treatment for two reasons. One is that you have extraized okay. in a double barrel zone and it is actually a diseased area. So he requires treatment for that you have a very good uh, uh, course of uh, next surgery for this patient. And also this patient extensive disease, which also indicates the patient should be on treatment. And regarding what treatment, yes. if the patient- Let me come uh, okay. uh, let me ask Dr. Rahman if he has a in comment. Uh, Dr. Rahman? Yes, uh, uh, thanks, Gavin. Uh, yeah. I think uh, uh, what Professor uh, I'm sorry, Philip but... said there. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah yes, please, yes, please. Yes. So uh, we should first uh, list, uh, stratify the patients based on the, uh, the age. This patient is not so young, not less than 30 years. So he's 42 years. So risk is not so high. but uh, uh, he is uh, not uh, mentioned whether he is a smoker or not. And third one is uh, he has a risk factors of 
two or more surgery. So probably he has undergone already two surgery. Considering all these factors, uh, and he has also perianal disease. Considering all these factors, probably patient has a high risk of diseases. And uh, in such cases, it is better to start the pharmacological prophylaxis. If, if the patient has low risk patients, there are two options. One option is the pharmacological prophylaxis, and second option is the endoscopic guided therapy. So considering these uh, uh, risk factors of these particular patients, uh, uh, in my opinion, that, that we can start the pharmacological prophylaxis. And regarding the follow-up, and after six to 12 months, uh, we can follow up the patients regularly with clinical symptoms and also the inflammatory biomarkers. And after six to 12 months, we can do an clonoscopy to see the uh, disease status or endoscopic recurrences. Perfect. Thank you so much. Maybe let, let's make one more quick comment from, uh, from Dr. Anuradha. We didn't involve her into discussion. But let me understand from her that if there are inflammation at the resected margin, how important is this? in development of recurrence of, uh, of uh, recurrence of disease elsewhere in the GI tract. Yeah. Good evening, um, everybody. So uh, coming to the point of inflammation and involvement of the resected margins. So what we actually try to evaluate in histopathology is to look for the features of uh, chronicity and the inflammatory uh, changes. And um, the inflammatory changes which uh, are of more importance would be the activity, the cryptitis, the cryptapsis, and the uh, the basal plasma cytosis, um, presence of granulomas, the level of involvement of the granulomas, whether the mucosal, submucosal, and the architectural changes would be chronicity and any metaplasia. So this would uh, give us an indication um, whether the resected margin is uh, was put on in the type of plexus. His colonoscopy was repeated six months later after surgery, and indeed uh, he was found to have uh, after ulcers both in afferent and efferent limb of a double barrel uh, uh, surgery. So certainly uh, he developed disease within six months. We all know this patient has a more, of, more or less a, a aggressive course. We're also thinking that if we can give him biologic to prevent uh, uh, the further stricture in this. With this, I come back to one more important point, which is not uh, relevant to this patient, that many patients with uh, Crohn's disease do have intestinal strictures. You give anti-inflammatory therapy, either biologic or uh, as a hybrid, they improve, inflammation improves. But they remain symptomatic because of those strictures, because of their pain persists. In those, those situations, uh, there's an option of uh, endoscopic balloon dilatation. And at this point in time, let me invite uh, uh, for a very quick comment because time is very limited. Uh, Dr. Mohan Ramzandani, I think uh, uh, he's uh, one of the top class uh, endoscopists and gastroenterologists in the country. And uh, he's uh, world famous. He published a very important paper a couple of weeks back in gastroenterology. Uh, Mohan, if you're there. Yeah. Uh, I de definitely like to comment on endoscopic treatment. It is definitely, uh, 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 the balloon dilatation is one part, but now there are many other techniques being developed to tackle these strictures, including the incision therapy or doing a stricturoplasty by application of cutting and application of clips. Also, many stents are being developed to tackle these strictures. But one thing is uh, for sure that the endoscopic treatment should be restricted for simple strictures. And one has to define these simple strictures because uh, the complex strictures are still reserved for surgeon, especially if they are associated with abscesses or fistulas. But the complex short strictures are definitely uh, the one which we should aim for and especially the endoscopy can be a very, very rewarding procedure, especially once you are treating multiple strictures which may not be amenable for surgery because it will ultimately lead to short bowel syndrome or anorectal strictures because there will be, if surgery is done, it requires permanent ileostomy or the patient who are having comorbidities who, who cannot be taken up for surgery can be still treated by endoscopic treatment. So, uh, a, a definition of complex versus simplex stricture is the utmost importance and those, whom, uh, those who are symptomatic stricture should undergo a very good trans, uh, trans abdominal scanning including MR or CT enterography to, to define the length of strictures, a stricture less than 5 cm, stricture with absence of abscess or you know uh, the fistulae are really uh, amenable for endoscopic treatment. So we should have 
of uh, because there's lack of time we cannot discuss much but i think uh, endoscopic offers a very important armamentorium in management of crohn's disease uh, especially simple strictures ah uh, thank you mohan i think we have run uh, really out of time so i will there's one for therapy which for hyperbaric uh, oxygen therapy there's initial data and i'll skip this in interest of time just to give some learning point that uh, in country like ours in those patient come with uh, uh, this kind of symptom that this patient has always think of tuberculosis and crohn's disease try all the methods to rule out tuberculosis before you start treating the patient for crohn's disease one start early treatment early aggressive therapy is the keystone and we also we know that uh, unless we treat aggressively at the initial phase there will be more complications and these patients need to be monitored well with this i thank all the panelists for their very generous and uh, very expert comments uh, and uh, i hand over uh, to dr rupa uh, if you are going to discuss general scan or for concluding remarks uh, we had some questions i'm not sure we will have time to discuss but i'll leave it to dr rupa banerji uh, depending upon how much time we have for this uh, uh, okay. uh, and we are quite uh, uh, you know it was a very very interesting case ida i think closing remarks from you before we hand it over to dr g n ramesh uh, from me um okay um no i wasn't going to make any closing remarks i, I think uh, it was a very interesting um session actually uh, govan um it's a shame that uh, you know in the interest of time we can't really uh, say too much more than that so i think uh, really i i uh, want to thank uh, govin again for uh, the wonderful presentation and all the very important learning points and to all the panelists thank you very much um Rupa, thanks thank you i would now i mean in the interest of time i uh, think partha yeah. had some journals uh, which he will put it up for uh, the fellows and uh, and then over to so uh, just uh, yeah heading. so yeah the, uh, this is a systematic review and meta analysis i chose this article uh, this is on balloon assisted endoscopy uh, assisted dilatation of small bowel strictures this is from the star consortium that is stenosis treatment and anti fibrotic research consortium they included 18 studies and almost more than 1000 endoscopic balloon dilatations as well as they collected individual 218 patients data to predict risk factors of clinical success and recurrent symptoms it is uh, in that uh, systematic review they have concluded that endoscopic balloon dilatation has high technical and clinical success and low complication rates that is almost 5.3% compared to other strictures which are uh, close to 2.8 and 2.9% and the recurrent symptoms are seen in half of the patients and two third of the patients require redilatation of ends or surgery and patients who have both involvement of small bowel and large bowel and um, these are the patients who are more uh, less likely to respond to endoscopic balloon dilatation and with a longer stricture like uh, with every increase in 1 cm of uh, stricture the risk of surgery increases by 8% and i'll also ask the fellows to read this that is a uh, published in lancet april 2020 there's a practical guidelines on endoscopic treatment of crohn's disease strictures from the global interventional ibd group thank you uh, thank you partha uh, over to dr gn ramesh thank you very Our much uh, director thank you very much can i share the screen just a, a very very short presentation um yeah, is it is it visible yeah yeah so uh, my duty as the course director is to propose a vote of thanks and uh, it's been as we come to the end of the first session it's been a wonderful journey uh, it started some time back and uh, a few of us have been sitting together brainstorming about topics how to break up the topics into small small parts and make it very interesting i think uh, we could not have had a better better start than professor david rubin i thank him for the inauguration as well as for the master, wonderful master class where he outlined some of the unmet challenges and diagnoses and that has indeed given us a lot of food for thought as well as topics for future meetings of course for dear nagi for the welcome address he's always there for our support and dr ida hilmi for anchoring this session so beautiful and for a glamorous presence 
Dr. Neeraj Joshi, your window into Nepal was extremely interesting. And um, I think this is something that we wanted a peep into IBD in Nepal and a peep into the culture of Nepal. And you did both quite superlatively. To Dr. Govind Makaria and the big team that uh, he handled uh, for the panel discussion, I know he could not have done justice to all the topics or all the areas in small bowel structures, but the flow was very interesting and a lot of, I think the fellows would have gained a lot by attending this uh, particular panel discussion. We will, of course, in our next uh, few uh, 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 upcoming sessions, deal with some of these sessions, uh, some of these areas more closely. To my co-director, Dr. Jayanti, Dr. Usha Datta, and the other co-directors, thanks. And coming up next month, don't miss it out, miss out on that. 14th of May, 2021. And we have, uh, the theme is management issues in ulcerative colitis. The topics have already been decided. And if you note, it is all very practical, acute problems of ulcerative colitis, how do I manage? Of course, a keynote address is going to be infections in ulcerative colitis. Besides that, we are going to tackle the problem about bleeding, severe pain, and flare during pregnancy. And a very, very interesting, the cherry on the cake, when GI meets the surgeon, the surgeon's perspective. And don't forget to join us. Please make a note of it, May 14th. And from our team at IBD ENC Masterclass, have a great festival season ahead and see you on May 14th. Thank you very much. I think we've had an excellent session. Thank you, Dr. Ramesh. Thank you, everyone, for uh, joining. And nothing ends before the last slide. For all our uh, team here, Robin, uh, Chatterjee, Mr. Satya Narayana, uh, Mr. Vishwesh, all of whom you know who have been behind the screen working, uh, making the videos that you just saw. Our academic partners, Dr. Reddy Labs, uh, Micro Labs, and of course, the entire IBD ENC team. See you again on 14th May. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you so much.